All right. Hello, class, and uh, welcome back to part B of this lecture. So in part A, we talked about the Oberth effect, how it's greatly advantageous to dump your propellant at the bottom of a gravity well rather than uh, somewhere up here, because you know, that potential energy of your propellant, and there's also the kinetic energy argument, uh, the potential energy of the propellant, right, is in the bottom of the gravity well has all been transferred to kinetic energy. And then if you leave your propellant at the bottom of the gravity well, well, that energy, kinetic energy is retained by the spacecraft to some extent. In this part, we're going to talk about the logical conclusion of that um, observation by Herman Oberth, which is the sort of counterintuitive uh, bioelliptic transfer. I guess I should say something about Hermann Oberth, though it, it's a little bit tricky. I mean, Ober, Hermann Oberth was, unlike Walter Hohmann, uh, a Nazi rocket scientist, so working on weapons uh, like Werner von Braun. And uh, he's not quite as problematic as Werner von Braun, who was an enthusiastic Nazi, member of the SS. Um, he did... He was a lower level and he did quit weapon design after the war and moved to Switzerland. He did join Werner von Braun for a little bit of time in, 19, in the late 50s, but then went back to Switzerland to retire. So it's hard to, hard to know what to make about Hermann Over. Incidentally, if you've ever seen a picture of him, we don't have a picture of him in here because, I don't know, I not not a big fan of the, the Nazi rocket scientists. Uh, a very, very interesting guy. Um, very colorful. Uh, I think he, he was, if you've ever seen the, the Pixar movie Up, I think he was the inspiration for the curmudgeoning old guy in, in that movie. Anyway, enough about Herb and Overth. I'm getting distracted. Uh, so the, the bioelliptic transfer... So the bioelliptic transfer is a clever way of using the Oberth effect to minimize delta V consumption when your target orbit is very high. And this is actually a very poor picture of them. I mean, it's very good for our purposes in that it outlines the transfer orbit. It's a two burn, it's a two, two transfer orbit maneuver. Uh, but it, it doesn't really illustrate when the bioelliptic is useful, which is, when your initial orbit is very close to the planet, your target orbit is very far out. So in this case, say you're going straight to your target orbit, right? Single transfer orbit there. There's your transfer orbit. Well, so the problem here is that, okay, your initial delta V to get out there is very efficient because it uses the Oberth effect. It's very close to the gravity well. The problem is when you get to this target orbit, you're moving very, very slowly, almost zero velocity. And so you have to have a significant delta V2 here to get into your target orbit. And that's problematic because when you do a delta V maneuver this far out in space, that potential energy you've, in your propellant, you've gone way back up out of the gravity well and so your potential, your, your propellant has a lot of potential energy. So if you dump it there, well, you've lost a lot of energy. And so this delta V2, while it's not huge, can be substantial. And so if that, this effect is significant, then what we find is that if it's worthwhile actually getting a little bit farther out, right? Using your propellant at this point, to create a very large delta V so that you actually escape the gravity well or almost escape the gravity well of the planet. Right? This is V equals zero. And why would you want to do that? Because obviously you're not, it's not to leave the planet, but to orbit it. So you actually almost escape from the, the gravity well of the planet. Well, the advantage is when you're this far out, right? your orbital maneuvers become more efficient. So if you're interested in, say, raising your periaps, which is the goal of this second burn, delta V2, if 
you're interested in raising your periaps, that's almost free, uh, periaps raising maneuver. So when we get to interplanetary trajectories in lecture 14, uh, we'll see that, in fact, you can choose your, uh, through cho choice of targeting radius, you can choose your radius of periaps almost arbitrarily through very little to no delta v maneuvers. So you can, so periaps raising is almost free here in this maneuver because you're very close to the edge of the gravity well. And then when you come back, right, there is a very inefficient delta V maneuver, delta V3, which lowers your apoaps. So reduces your apoaps all the way down from here down to here. Right. So, but if, say, here's the, the limit of a parabolic orbit, let's say, if your target orbit is relatively far out, right, well, then that third delta V maneuver, even though it's completely wasted because it's negative delta V maneuver, you're lowering, you're de decreasing the energy of the orbit, is so small that you that the overall benefit is 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 positive so that the change in delta v from the two burn maneuver to three burn maneuver at periaps is very small because you make very efficient use of the oberth effect this maneuver is small and this maneuver is small and if your target orbit is far enough out the cost of these two maneuvers is so negligible that it's more efficient than this rather significant apogee raising maneuver in the two burn case. Right. So another way of thinking about it is, right, if your target orbit is so is significantly far out, no matter if your delta v is positive or negative, the fact that you have so much potential energy in that propellant makes that burn so inefficient that it doesn't really matter if it's positive or negative, whether it's gaining or lowering energy of the orbit. It's all pretty much wasted. Right? Remember that delta V squared versus over 2 divided by plus delta V V, right? This is typically negligible. This is always more important. Right? So in our, So in this case, Essentially, what we're doing is we're going, we're boosting to escape velocity, which remember for geo is 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 almost the same as getting to Mars, right? Uh, so escape velocity is is not that hard to get to. Not that hard to escape the velocity well of planet, uh, gravity well of the planet. Um, and so, in this case, we are going to make use of that. Right? So this is a three burn maneuver, as we we've proven earlier on that an optimal the Hohmann transfer is optimal for a two burn maneuver but we're going to get away from, around that proof by instituting what's now a three burn maneuver essentially escape reinsertion and insertion into your target orbit so there are three parts three two transfer orbits and three delta v burns here right so let's like go through them so your first transfer orbit uh, is a, you have an injection very close to the planet, delta V1. That puts you on an initial transfer orbit here. It's an elliptic orbit. Goes out to a target radius, right? So the farther out, the better. The closer you can get to uh, the um, to infinity, uh, the more efficient this maneuver will be. Next, we have a delta V2, which is a positive burn, which raises our periaps. And hopefully that's going to be small. And that puts us on the second arc of our second transfer orbit, which is here. And then we have a third delta V burn, uh, which is negative, all wasted energy, which injects us into our target orbit. So that's the idea. So let's uh, quantify these things a little bit more. Um, so here we've got two transfer orbits. Let's highlight them. Transfer one and transfer 
two, right? And these are two ellipses. Let's call uh, let's call transfer one and transfer two. So for transfer two, obviously our radius of periapse is our initial orbit. Let's call it R1. And our apoapse is that target radius, which we want to be as large as possible. Now the larger the target radius, the longer this is going to take. It's going to take quite a bit of time in any case, but the larger this target radius is, the more time this is maneuver is going to take. The second transfer orbit starts from the apoapse because it's a you want to raise the periapse, right? So the the apoapse of the second transfer is that same r star, right? So in, unlike the Hohmann transfer, right, we're not going to periapse. So we start at apoapse at r star, which is really far out, farther than the target radius obviously. And of course, when we get back, we want to be in our target orbit. So the periapse of our second transfer is the target radius. So let's call it RT, uh, which we'll also call R2. So this is also R2 here. So obviously, uh, as I said, the larger your target radius is, the better, and it can be chosen arbitrarily, just the bigger, the better. So does what does this result in energy savings? That's that's of course the main question. So let's uh, again talk about the orbital elements of these two transfers. One transfer two. Right. So again, right. Uh, the two orbital elements, R p plus R a divided by two gives us our semi-major axis, right? So the in both cases, our star is our apoapse, and our periapse is, in the first case, is our initial orbit radius, and in the, and in the second transfer orbit, it's that where we want to be, our desired orbit. So we can also call this R2 r2 and then we have a d2 too maybe uh, for our eccentricity right we can uh, use the formulas we have here right for a quick and easy form of eccentricity so that gives us r a minus r p divided by r a plus r p so that's a just closed form solution for the eccentricity of this uh, of this of, a, of any order, but really, in terms of the periapse and apoapse. And another useful, I don't think we've actually listed this one before, so it's quite a useful formula. Uh, next, of course, for our um, second transfer, same formula. Uh, in this case, of course, apoapse is that one, apoapse is that one. Periapse is that one, periapse is that one. Right. So there we have our, the orbital elements for both our transfer orbits, AE and AE. Right. So now the question is to calculate, of course, the delta Vs uh, we use for these, um, these delta V burns and see if they actually improve our situation or not over the Hohmann transfer. Right. So there's, uh, again, three delta Vs required. Uh, the first one, right, we are in a circular orbit uh, initially, and then we have a velocity of periapse in our desired orbit. So delta V1, actually, I should write it over here. Delta V1 is velocity at periapse of the first transfer orbit minus the velocity of our circular orbit at that initial velocity. Right? So that velocity of a circular orbit is there. And we use our conveniently formulated um, formulas for velocity of periapse here. So that's RA and that's RP. So we have that, remember that closed form solution for velocity of periapse, which you gave in the previous lecture. 
The second delta V, right, is uh, a little bit different than the Hohmann transfer. So we initially have, we're initially moving at a velocity on this first transfer at velocity of apoapse at on the first transfer. Right, so actually, let me go ahead and highlight these two transfers. Right, there we go. Uh, let's see what I'm using green. So we arrive at a velocity at apoapse of the first transfer, and we want to, in order to get on that new transfer orbit, we need our velocity to be the velocity at apoapse on the second transfer orbit. Okay. So in this case, uh, we've got our delta V2 then is the velocity we need, VA2, minus the velocity we have, which is VA1. So velocity of apoapse, same formula, both cases. Right. In both cases, the uh, radius of apoapse is r star. Both cases. In the uh, the case uh, in the, the second transfer, first transfer orbit, right? That's our r p one. So r a one and r a two are the same. And then in this one, our radius of periapse is our desired orbit, r two, um, or r p two. So that gives us our second delta V. So delta V1, delta V2. And now our, for our third delta V, uh, on arrival, right, um, just before our delta V, our velocity is VP2, so for our second transfer orbit. And we want our velocity to be, afterwards, VC2. Now, we're going to be moving too fast at this point. Right. So in particular, if we do just line up these these velocities, right, V C two, oops, not two C, C two, is larger than V P two. And so we need a delta V burn which is negative, negative delta V three, and that magnitude of course is the difference between those two vectors. Now, occasionally I assign these, pro these, these, these bioelliptics on exams or homeworks and stuff. And <laughs> inevitably, um, on a, a significant fraction of the, uh, of the answers, uh, a student will write, uh, this final delta V is negative, right? And it'll give a negative value for this, like negative one or something, or 0 0.1 or something like that. So they'll write delta V1 is, say, 3, delta V2 is, or maybe 3.8, delta V2 is like 0.2, and delta V3 is negative 0.1, and I'll ask what's the total delta V, and they'll say, well, the total delta V is uh, V1 plus V2 plus V3, which is like, uh, you know, they subtract off the, the 0.1. So <laughs> don't make that mistake, right, because even though this is a negative delta V burn, it's not like you get that energy back, right? It's, it's wasted energy. So your delta V budget is the sum total, the magnitudes of these three. So don't get that confused. In any case, uh, so delta V3 here, uh, velocity of a circular orbit here, Vc2, minus the velocity at periapse on the second transfer. Oop. What did I do here? Must have pushed the home button or something. Uh, two. Right. There we go. So again, we have our third delta v, uh, and again the total delta v is the sum of the magnitudes of those. In this the way, I've written it. Of course, they're all positive. So, but just in case you decided to make that a negative, don't write. It's the magnitudes. I'm sure you wouldn't make that mistake. Right. Um, so again, right, this is what I was saying in two, two slides ago. That third burn, negative. Clearly all wasted energy. But burns at high altitude uh, involve a lot of wasted energy anyway. So 
depending on how high your target orbit is, uh, then this the amount of waste may be prohibitive or it may be may help you, right? It may may not be prohibitive. So for this reason, uh, bioelectrics only work when this target is high up. Uh, or, or not transfer, but target. I should write maybe RD, desired. Or RF, I think I'm using here. So let me do RF. And in particular, it's a, even if you go to have the perfect bioelectric, and the perfect bioelectric corresponds to R, R star equals infinity. That's my star. Well done. Even if your R star is infinity, bioleptics will only save you energy if the ratio of your desired to initial orbit is 12 or greater. Right? So if, say for example, uh, you're launching from the surface of the Earth, 6378, uh, bioleptics are only relevant if uh, your uh, target is Six three seven eight times twelve or greater. Right. So what is six three seven eight times twelve? I can ask Siri that. Hey Siri, what's six three seven eight times twelve? It's seventy six thousand five hundred thirty six. Seventy six thousand five hundred thirty six kilometers. So geo, remember, is 44,000 or 42,000. So bioleptics are not going to help you getting to geo. So the use of bioleptics is uh, relatively rare because we have relatively few satellites out beyond geo. Uh, but it can be useful if, right, in that particular circumstance, right? So when your target radius is 76,536 kilometers or greater. So let's assume now that our target is 76,536 kilometers or greater, and then talk a little bit about the choice of R star. Again, as R star goes to infinity, right, uh, you're getting more efficient. You're, getting, you're essentially escaping the Earth's gravity well and reinserting yourself. However, because you're getting close to that parabolic orbit, remember parabolic orbits slow down when they get far away. And what you're really looking for is you want an elliptic orbit, which gets to this other point over here. So as you get closer to that, uh, that perfect parabola, this arc of the orbit, this arc of the transfer orbit, here and here, that goes to infinity as R star goes to infinity. So again, this is an extreme case of the trade-off between uh, energy conservation or delta V budget and the time you're willing to tolerate for getting to where you desire to go. Uh, there's lots of cases of this in space, by the way. Um, for example, uh, there's the interplanetary transport network, which I don't want to get into, but uh, basically, you can get free uh, free passage from uh, libration points to other to planetary bodies if you're willing to tolerate a generation or two uh, to get there. So obviously, most of us aren't. Um, so this is just a uh, this is a sketch from uh, Velado's great work on fundamentals of astrodynamics and applications. Uh, which illustrates the use of bioleptics uh, as compared to the Hohmann transfer. So this is uh, this is our ratio right here of R to R. The, this is actually R over R initial, right? So let's we can just think of these as Earth radii. Right. So this uh, this is your target uh, radius R desired in Earth radii, and this gives you the delta V required for a Hohmann transfer. Here, I'll just highlight it for us. And these curves over here gives you the delta V required for a bioleptic for different values of R star for that design parameter. And here's the infinite K 
case. Right? So you see in the perfect case with r equals infinity, uh, we can achieve, achieve substantial savings. Right? Remember this one here is 76,000 kilometers. We can achieve substantial delta v savings by using a bioliptic if we're going really far out. And what's actually more interesting, or almost more interesting, is in both the Hohmann and the bioliptic case, beyond 76,000 kilometers, the delta V required to get to these orbits actually drops, right? And that's, why is that? Well, that's because um, be, when you get far enough out, right, the delta V required for injection into the desired orbits becomes very small because the orbits are very slow. So in all cases, even in the Hohmann case, right, delta V drops once you get past geo, which is counterintuitive, again, because of that, that idea that orbits have energy, right? These are higher energy orbits, right? These ones out here, because or energy is proportional to semi-major axis, or negative, remember, negative mu over 2a, right? But I guess as A gets very large, right, this gets closer to zero, and so that energy differential really saturates. There's not much more going on. And so at these high energy orbits, uh, you can, or very slow orbits, high potential, low kinetic, uh, you can achieve substantial savings over the Hohmann transfers by using these bioliptic transfers. Right. So again, uh, here we've got, uh, there's a, a plot here at 15, where this, uh, the energy savings becomes quite substantial. Um, so that's essentially the bioliptic case in a nutshell. Uh, we'll do uh, just one uh, numerical illustration to illustrate. Um, so suppose we're in an initial circular orbit, right? Essentially at low Earth orbit, like at, at the surface of the Earth, essentially. And we have a target orbit, which is very high up, 376,000 kilometers, very far out, um, libration point kind of distance. And we want to design the energy optimal orbital maneuvers to reach our destination. So this will give us some idea of what kind of energy savings we can expect in terms of delta V. Okay. So let's first uh, calculate this, convert to Earth radii because a lot of this stuff is in Earth radii, right? And again, I use canonical units quite often here for reasons that it's so uh, they're a little bit easier to visualize. I mean, 80 Earth radii, 60 Earth radii. Uh, these large numbers are a little bit easier to visualize in Earth radii. Anyway, so uh, here's our initial R1, R1. And here's our target orbit, 60 Earth radii, pretty far out. So if we go back to these, this plot, 60 Earth radii, there we are. Uh, this plot indicates that we can achieve uh, substantial uh, delta V savings, maybe, uh, if we use a bioliptic. However, it also tells us that our target orbit obviously needs to be greater than um, 60 Earth radii, clearly. Uh, and a, a good choice would be 200 for our target radius, um, or anything greater, right? because the larger that target radius, the increase in delta V savings. Right. Um, we're pretty impatient in this class, and so we're going to like use a target radius of 80 Earth radii. So that's not substant. That's not great. That's like halfway. So we should only expect a delta V savings of uh, looks like about 0.1 delta V savings, about 0.1 kilometers per second. So let's see. Let's see how well that lines up. I don't. I'm just reading off the plot. So let's calculate our transfer ellipse. Uh, obviously, our, uh, initial, our initial semi-major axis is going to be very close to just 80 divided by 2, right? So 40.5. This gives us some of the Vs we need, right? So let's like plot out our transfer orbits. So delta V1. Uh, is velocity of the periapse of the first one minus the V circular. So there's V circular, one, basically. 
Uh, velocity of periaps on that transfer orbit is actually not huge, right? I mean, nothing gets that much greater than one uh, in Earth radii per time unit here. Uh, so this one is equal to 1.4 pack, well, 1.385. These digits are going to matter. So our initial delta v is uh, point, about 0.4, right? 1.385 minus 0.985 is about 4 Earth radii, uh, point, point, sorry, point 0.4 Earth radii per time unit. That's fairly big, right? I mean, again, none of these delta v's, right? Unless you want to go to Mars, even if you go to Mars, right, it's going to be 0.45 or something like that. Right? None, of these, uh, del none of these velocities are huge. Uh, but in any case, you're gaining energy by dumping, it, dumping propellant close to the gravity well. Next, we get out here and we need to calculate those two apps velocities. So VA1, we calculate using that formula we had on the previous slide, is 0 0.0178, right? Moving very slowly out there when we arrive. And we need to boost to VA2 which we haven't calculated yet. Yeah. So what is VA2? And that's obviously the next step. So our second transfer is uh, R star, which is, remember, 80, and uh, our target, which is 60. This is not a great, uh, by the way, bioelliptic. It's not very energy saving. We should really make this larger, like 200, but we're not. So anyway, the average of those is 70, right? So there we go. Uh, so now let's look at that uh, second arc. Actually, let me go, just go grab the whole picture here. So I don't have to redraw the thing. Make it a little bit smaller so it fits on the slide better. There we go. All right, so, uh, all right. So now we're uh, here, right? We need, we found this, uh, well, what did we find actually? Cut it off, 0 0.0178. And now our apoapse velocity at, on this line, we just use the equation. We find the apoapse velocity that we need uh, is uh, 0 0.103. So significantly greater. But again, both of these numbers are very small. Right. If we went farther out, this would be much smaller, right? As we get as R star goes to infinity, these, this term here goes to zero. So uh, then we have so our second delta v is 0 0.103 minus 0.178, and that gives us a delta v2 of 0 0.0857. Again, if we made R star large, that would be that would go down to zero. So this this is this is like inefficient. This is the inefficient part. Next, uh, our final delta V, when we get to periaps, we're going to be moving that fast, VP2. And we want to be moving a little bit slower to be on a circular orbit, VC2. Right? And so we have to find that negative delta V3. So the desired square root of mu over R2 is velocity is 0.13, not huge, right? 0.13, and our velocity on approach will be 0.138. Again, plugging the numbers into the formula we have on the previous slide, VP2. So again, you see this difference is relatively minor, right? Because we're so far out, injection into that circular orbit is not costing us a lot. So that's a velocity of 0.009 nine earth radii per time unit. And I've, uh, I, I have the negative sign here. So, but don't write, add these things together because then, right, that's not how it works, how delta V works. So again, very small. Right. This is the most inefficient part here. And again, if we got closer to earth ray, to R star is infinity, this would get smaller. This would get a little bit bigger. And so this part would be a little less efficient. In any case, uh, let's add these things together. Our total delta V budget comes out to, we add those, the magnitudes of those three things together, 0.4938, uh, 
which corresponds to a total delta V budget of 3.9 kilometers per second. Incidentally, for reference, the delta V budget to get to geo is 3.8 kilometers per second. So we're not talking about a huge change. Right? Uh, the total delta V budget for a Hohmann transfer to this orbit, however, is four. Right? So in the end, we've saved delta V savings 0.1 kilometers per second. Now, this may not seem like a huge amount compared to the amount of fuel needed to get off the Earth, which is about 9 kilometers per second, uh, 9.3 or something like that. However, because of how rockets work, the last bit of delta V is always the most expensive. It gets exponentially more expensive, and that's why we have staged rockets. So again, we'll talk about this again in Lecture 11. The cost, of course, is time, uh, the time we've taken to get to our star. We were actually relatively efficient, so it only took 24.75 days. Uh, by comparison for a Hohmann transfer, uh, the, I actually didn't calculate the, the time it would take, but it's probably on the order of, I would guess, eight, 19 days. So actually, probably it, it doesn't take that much longer to use this bioelliptic than a home and transfer for the same orbit, but I'm not, well, actually, it would be half of that because there's, for, for a home and transfer, there's only one arc. Here there's two arcs, right? T, delta T1 and delta T2. So essentially, uh, it's gonna, for a home and transfer, it would be about half of this and a little less, so maybe 10 days, I would guess. Just spitballing there. Anyway, uh, so that sort of brings a wrap to our discussion of the home and transfer. Uh, in the next part of this lecture, we'll talk about out-of-plane maneuvers, which is, uh, requires a little bit of introduction and spherical trigonometry, and so I'll leave that for a future recording.